The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Alistair McLeod, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, this is Alistair McLeod on behalf of the Gold Money Foundation. And on the line from Scottsdale in Arizona, I'm very pleased to have Charles Goyette, who is the author of the New York Times best-selling book, The Dollar Meltdown, Surviving the Impending Currency Crisis with Gold, Oil, and Other Unconventional Investments. And that uh, Congressman uh, Ron Paul called a must-read, and investor Peter Schiff describes as a sensible plan to protect your wealth. And his latest book is Red and Blue and Broke All Over, subtitled Restoring America's Free Economy. Charles is also the editor of the Freedom and Prosperity Letter, which is a monthly political and financial newsletter. And the newsletter includes bi-weekly podcasts. He has years of experience as a financial professional in the commodities, securities, currency, and precious metals business. And he has also been a participant in political and financial debate, appearing on Fox News, CNN, MN, MSNBC, and CNBC, and so on and so forth. Welcome, Charles. It's very nice to have you on. Alistair, it is a uh, great pleasure to uh, be on your program. Thank you very much. Uh, I understand, um, uh, before we get going, that uh, when I, I, I had a look at your uh, bio on, um, uh, on Wikipedia, that um, uh, you were kicked off uh, one radio station for being uh, a, a peace-loving uh, liberal. Is this true? <laughs> Yeah, it's a ver- first first time for everything. I uh, I made myself unwelcome in uh, certain segments of America, large segments, I think hysterical segments of America, back in uh, 2002 and 2003 with my opposition to the elective war in Iraq. It was an extraordinarily unpopular position to take in what is uh, what is normally called uh, right wing talk radio in America, and uh, the company for which I worked was a. a Texas Corporation that had long ties to President Bush, the uh, the uh, vice chairman of the company. In fact, is the fellow that made uh, Bush a millionaire by by buying Bush's baseball team. So here they had one of their preeminent uh, talk show hosts on one of their flagship radio stations opposing the president in a way that nobody else in that industry, or at least on any of their stations, was doing, and they did not like it very much. And so I I uh, sabotaged my career. Only in America. <laughs> um, anyway, what I would like to talk about is the situation in America. Um, we are now so fed up, I think, recycling information on Europe that is quite refreshing <laughs> to consider your problems rather than our problems. First of all, um, Charles, please tell me that there is something nice going on in America. Can you think of anything? Well, yeah. I, I actually can think of, uh, of one or two things. I suppose the, the thing that I find uh, most helpful going on here is the the awakening that uh, the Ron Paul presidential campaign has had, at least in the minds of uh, young people on college campuses and so on, people who are beginning to see through this uh, the statism, the, uh, the, the Keynesian economics of the Republicans and Democrats, who have begun to break a- away from this. Alistair, in the 1980s, I uh, talked with Ron Paul about creating a committee to abolish the Fed. And uh, he was busy at the time, too busy to do anything, and I was too busy to do anything at the time, but it was in the 1980s, and it's a good thing that we didn't waste a lot of time on it because nobody would have cared. But today, there's an, there's an enormous awakening in uh, the part of uh, particularly the young people, that they are being bamboozled, they're being burdened with uh, uh, debts uh, for the rest of their lives, the prospects of them enjoying the uh, living standard that uh, the prior generation has had uh, may be fleeting. And so they're awakening to this, and, and I think that is a good thing. Well, yes, I, th- I, I think so too, um, because uh, in a sense, I think what Ron Paul was doing was um, – uh, doing what we're trying to do, and that is educate people in, um, you know, in the benefits of sound money, in effect. And if you have a central bank that uh, prints money at a drop of a hat, obviously that's <laughs> that's hardly the route to sound money. Which brings me on to the Fed. Um, and the Fed seems to think, despite all experiences, 
that it can manage the economy by varying interest rates um, and, you know, just chucking money at the problem. What's your take on this, Charles? Well, I think that they're beginning to they're beginning to understand, uh, at least surreptitiously, they're not talking about it, that they don't know they don't know what they're doing, and it's a great acknowledgement for them to make. I think there's a little bit of fear among people at the uh, the Fed that has not been present. We are, Alistair, we are, I suppose, now 54, maybe 55 months into this uh, downturn. The Fed has uh, uh, it, it has empowered the exploding of uh, the debt, empowered the uh, the uh, fiscal authorities with uh, running up massive uh, debts. They have created trillions of, of dollars buying uh, the, the bad paper of uh, the money center banks by buying the bad debt of the United States Treasury. And the idea that the Fed could have taken these actions, could have exploded the, the monetary base by a couple of trillion dollars, and that it will have no impact, that this can can have been done without any consequences is, of course, laughable in its absurdity. And uh, I, I think they're beginning to understand that they, they have a problem and they don't know how to get out of it. Yeah, I, I, th- I think you're right. And, um, you know, I, I've got quite a lot of sympathy for the central bankers. Not that I ever advocate central banking, far from it. But they are actually in, 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 in a very, very deep hole. And um, given that their education is entirely neoclassical, either Keynesian or monetarism, um, they really just don't know where the hell to turn, it seems to me. Um, but if, if you look at um, the broader picture, most of the money that is created in the economy is obviously created in the banking system by the expansion of bank credit. And um, my, um, uh, if you like, understanding of what's happened in America since the financial crisis is that there has been a tendency for this bank credit to contract. And to some extent, the Fed is trying to replace that by expanding narrow money, if you like, cash money. Um, is, is that how you see it? it? It's very much how I see it. And it puts us in a peculiar situation in which a, a recovery threatens to make things much, much worse. In other words, when uh, when when uh, the banking system begins to uh, loan again, when commercial credit begins to to grow, which you would think would make uh, all the concerned parties uh, uh, pleased at a recovery, it threatens to unleash this this monster of uh, of, of uh, monetary creation that so far has been more more or less sitting there idle. I've described it in uh, the dollar meltdown, Alistair, as as like a a race car at the starting line. And, you know, it's all, a, you know, it's, it's all a, a lot of noise and so on as the engines rev. It's very, very loud. But nothing happens until the clutch is popped. And then all of a sudden, you know, the, the, when, the light, when the light turns green and the clutch is popped, you know, the, the race cars take off in a, in a big cloud of burning rubber and smoke and noise and so on and so forth. And that's where we are today. They've created this, uh, this, 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 this massive monetary base. And uh, when commercial lending begins to get underway again, it represents a, it, it represents a, a virtual tidal wave of uh, of as you've described it of, of uh, uh, leveraged currency inflation through the banking system. Yes, that's right. I, for our, the benefit of our um, our listeners, uh, most of this mark money at the moment is parked on the uh, Fed's own balance sheet, as I understand it. Uh, in the form of um, reserves, safest place for it, I suppose. Um, I, yeah, uh, but the, you know, even even so, uh, there is no sign, I think, of um, this money going into the economy and being used positively. So the Fed still must be very, very concerned, and they've got themselves into a bit of a hole because um, if they were to uh, do more quantitative easing. Um, it could undermine the dollar quite significantly. Um, and there is a lot of criticism. Everybody's watching for quantitative easing, and of course it's not happening. Yet, presumably, they don't do more quantitative easing because of the implications for the dollar. As, have, am I reading this correctly, Charles? Yes, and uh, today, in fact, the Fed has uh, had a meeting in which they've, and today as we speak, as we, uh, as we do this interview, in which they've decided to extend their, uh, their operation twist rather than to do an overt uh, quantitative easing. Um, but, you know, my, my view is that they, you know, they're, they're basically monetizing debt uh, virtually every day. I mean, 
the Fed, uh, uh, China with a trillion dollars in, 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 uh, U.S. Treasury, uh, debt holdings is second to the Federal Reserve, which holds, as I recall now, about 1.6 trillion. The difference being that when China buys U.S. Treasury instruments, when China loans the government money, they do it with real money. They, uh, they, they took real resources and real human labor, and they made real things that they sold to real people, they earned a profit on it, and they invest that money into our treasuries. When the Federal Reserve buys treasuries, and now at the, these extraordinary levels of $1.6 trillion, they are funding the government with money that they just created out of thin air that morning. And uh, so this, is, this continues to go on, but as far as the, the massive, overt, in the open, quantitative easing uh, three that many on Wall Street had, had expected, uh, uh, it has not materialized for now, which, which underscores my thesis, I think, that uh, there's a little bit of fear on the part of the Fed that all of these things that they have tried have been, uh, been ineffective, that they have a tiger by the tail, and, uh, they're <laughs> they, and that they, don't, they simply don't know what to do. Yeah, uh, that's that's certainly the season. Uh, sorry, the feeling I get. Um, the I, I, I was interested in in your contrast between China actually putting in genuine savings into treasuries, and when the Fed doing it, actually um, printing money to do it. Um, put another way, I suppose on the one hand you've got genuine savings going into it, and on the other hand you've got. Um, uh, the destruction of savings, because printing money is just destroying savings. Surely this is not a, a way to uh, getting any sustainable economic recovery going in the States. What's your view on this savings question? Yes, of course, growth comes from savings. Uh, we, have, we listen in this country to, to a depressing extent to Republicans and Democrats alike, uh, presidents alike who look no further than the next quarter and their next election prospects that encourage Americans to spend, 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 make the current numbers in the current quarter uh, look good, consumer spending is good, without any realization that, it, that it's uh, savings that creates prosperity, that nobody ever spent their way to prosperity, that it's savings that create prosperity. But this is, you know, this is, uh, this is the, the heritage of, of uh 75, 80 years of, of Republicans and Democrats and their Keynesian uh, nonsense in this country. And so we have spent ourselves into a situation now in, in which there are only two roads, in my view, before Americans right now, and, and those two roads are how will we manage the default. The, the debts are so massive, the visible debts of $16 trillion, but that's only, a, that's only a small part of the picture. The, uh, the, the hidden debts, the the uh, iceberg uh, portion of the iceberg that is below the water line that is invisible and threatens the crack up of the ship of the state is as it can be estimated at uh, I think conservatively at 120 trillion dollars they will never be paid and so the question is how will the state default on these debts it will destroy the currency in either event but it can default in a uh, in, in a uh, in a slow and very painful grinding manner of a prolonged inflation that destroys not only the currency over a few years, but destroys all of uh, the capital markets. It destroys the, uh, the fabric of, of uh, commercial trust that makes capitalism and prosperity work. They can do that, or, or we can have, uh, you know, we can, we can have a, 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 a confrontation with reality in which we acknowledge that the debts cannot uh, be paid. We can, we can, um, with the candid confrontation of reality, we can, you know, it's, it's amazing the dynamic of a free economy in the face of, of reality to restore itself, to right itself. And I cite examples of this in, uh, in the book Red and Blue and Broke All Over, the, the Depression of 1920. My friend Tom Woods said nobody ever heard of the Depression of 1920 because the economy was allowed to be free of interference and to right itself immediately post-World War II in America was the same thing. The Keynesians said, oh, you millions of men coming back. We have to have huge government jobs, programs, deficit spending, so on and so forth. We had none of that. We cut federal spending by almost two-thirds over the course of a few years, and the economy boomed. And then, of course, there's the, the, the wonderful example of the, uh, the German economic miracle after World War II in which in which uh, the, the, the government inter interference in uh, the economy and prices and so on uh, was, was abandoned, and uh, Germany uh, blossomed 
in a way that we I wish that we could today. So the the choices before Americans now are really whether we will have a a, a candid confrontation with the nature of reality or whether we will we will drag this thing out for years. Either way, the U.S. dollar is a a broken and failed currency. I think that's very interesting what you just said. I mean, if I can go back to uh, the 1921 uh, recession, um, that was the time when soldiers were returning. There was no work for them. Um, There was a very sharp recession. And um, they raised interest rates at that time to purge the economy of malinvestments. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing to do. But what happened was that it actually um, got the thing turning around very, very quickly. And then you had a, um, a wonderfully healthy economy in the early 1920s. And if I remember correctly... Um, not that I was there, but from what I've read, uh, Calvin Coolidge, who was president at the time, uh, said that if he had a legacy, if he had left a legacy, it was that he re- uh, um, he didn't interfere at all. And, uh, you know, th- that's such a contrast with the current situation. And you mentioned Germany as well. And um, that's one of the bees in my bonnet, because what the Germans have done uh, post-war is they have not interfered with people's savings. And uh, the result is that you have got the necessary capital for um, uh, a great depth, if you like, in man- manufacturing capability. Um, and so I think your two examples there are, are absolutely spot on. Um, Looking at the U.S. debt, um, you, you you reckon there's about 120 trillion of um, uh, on balance sheet and off balance sheet. That is a huge number. Now, I think I'm right in saying that quite a number of commentators uh, believe that the way in which this can be handled is through financial repression, but. Financial repression might be able to deal with a sort of, I don't know, the 16 trillion we've got. And, you know, as long as the state and other muni debt doesn't fall over and as long as government guarantees don't get called, um, you know, without the net present value of future liabilities, which presumably makes a large part of that 120 trillion, financial repression can't deal with it, surely. No. And and you're right to suggest that there's there's much more than uh, than than unfunded liabilities and and to cite uh, government guarantees. The Pew Research study came out the other day about all the uh, the promises made by uh, state governments and local governments across the United States with respect to pension uh, pension payments, pension for uh, retired workers and health care. And of course, there's a shortfall there that can be measured in a uh, trillion dollars plus student loan guarantees. It goes on and on. All of these things are, um, are, are the result of the Republican and Democratic uh, politics of the United States in which politicians make promises to get elected. There is no cost to them in making the promises to, to uh, college students that, uh, you know, you borrow money from the bank and we'll guarantee the bank will be happy to loan it to you uh, no matter your prospects when you get out of school because the federal government will guarantee that they will be paid back. There's no cost to the politicians to make those promises. They only get the uh, the applause and the approval of people that avail themselves of uh, of their those loans. And, of course, the uh, school administrators and the school, the education bureaucracy approves it, too, because it fattens uh, it fattens their wallets. But uh, uh, eventually there's a day of reckoning for all of these sorts of promises. And so we have trillions in guarantees and in, uh, in real estate guarantees, pension guarantees, uh, bank guarantees, um, education loan guarantees, retirement guarantees that we're not even even really considering when we talk about 120 trillion dollars in in hidden debt. It's you know it's it, this is the end of the uh, the monetary system in in the United States, and I, I've tried to explain it in a way that makes it accessible to people who have never thought about about monetary issues and indeed most Americans simply simply have it and so I thought I thought the best I could do to make it accessible to everybody is tell it in in uh, the tale of a, a childhood story that everybody will know and it's the it's the story Alistair of the three little pigs a story that everybody knows but th- in this case it's told in reverse and it has a uh, a moral to the story and originally the American people lived in a solid house that was uh, uh, like a brick house. It was made of gold. It was a gold standard, solid brick house that they liked very much. 
and uh, the the uh, state authorities came and said, you will have to vacate this house. We want those gold bricks. We're going to take those gold bricks, and if you don't turn them over to us uh, here in the uh, early 1930s, you can be fined $10,000, and you risk 10000 or 10 years in jail. And so the 10 years in jail, people, yeah. And the American people fled from the, uh, the solid uh, brick house of gold, the gold standard that they liked, and they fled into... Uh, what they were promised would actually be better, but it was a house of sticks, and it was a dollar exchange standard that prevailed until 1971, and then the winds of economic reckoning started blowing, and and uh, um, and a reality settled in, and that began to collapse on itself, and so the American people were chased then into the dollar reserve standard that is blowing apart now. It's like a house of straw that is being scattered to the uh, four winds, and some in America are beginning to understand this, thanks not only to our, our economic plight, but to the efforts of people like yourselves, like uh, um, like Congressman Paul and others, and they're beginning to, to grow nostalgic for that good, solid brick house. But I try to warn them. I think this is the most important warning out of this, because the people can be easily bamboozled again. Uh, it was uh, not so long ago that uh, the then head of the World Bank, Robert Zellick, said, well, you know, we need to get gold back into the monetary system. We need somehow to to index uh, index the monetary system with gold. But I like to caution people that if it's not if it's not a real gold standard in which you own physical gold that you can take in your possession at any time you want, if it's if it's not real gold but an indexing scheme, it's just another Another house, in fact, this would be a house of paper then that they've created, but they paint it to look like gold, but it is not a real gold standard. In fact, a house of paper is even flimsier than a house of straw or a house of sticks, but this is what is probably in the offing for the American people. Yes, I think that's a very um, uh, a, a very interesting and um, uh, a good analogy insofar as it does. I think it explains it very, very simply. Um, so... We now have the situation where uh, it looks like um, there's the big storms for the dollar itself. Um, can the dollar survive this, do you think? I mean, you know, the, the, there's nothing in the dollar. It's just paper. Um, it is the full faith of uh, the U.S. government, um, which is being increasingly questioned. Uh, you know, one wonders, what is the future for the dollar? How do you see it? The future is it, it, it will. It may survive in in some form, but it will certainly not be anybody's favorite currency any longer. It is a a currency that is being hollowed out before our very eyes. The pace will accelerate, and i i have uh, war, I have warned my readers to use the uh, European debt crisis as a uh, as an object lesson, so that they can benefit, as they watch this sovereign debt crisis unfold in in Europe. They can apply the lessons to the United States because, and I, I think there are three takeaways from it. First of all, the problem is always bigger, as it is in the United States, much bigger than the conventional wisdom acknowledges. You have, you know, boneheaded calls. Ben Bernanke told us the subprime crisis was over in 2007. Um, Moody's Investor Services uh, said a couple of years ago, two and a half or four years ago, that uh, anybody was concerned that the Greek government may be exposed to a liquidity crisis was was uh, misunderstood the situation. All of these things, the conventional wisdom never acknowledges the depth of the problem. That is a lesson from the European uh, travails that applies to us in the United States. Secondly, the solutions that are advanced by the governing classes are inadequate to this problem, and we have been through this, this, this drama in Europe of the European Central Bank and Greece and Spain and so has been going on for years now. And, uh, you know, they, they trot out one solution after another. None of them are adequate. The, uh, the news media breathlessly. My, my local newspaper here in Arizona this morning had a headline from the G20 that, you know, somehow some new solution to calm the European currency waters was, uh, was in the offing. We have been reading headlines like this for years. The mainstream media misreports this stuff. There is, uh, never any there there sometimes. Sometimes these reports, I, re I remember a report that the 15 European nations were going to provide the banks with liquidity to solve this problem three and a half years ago that ran the Dow up <laughs> yes. 936 points in one day. 
And, of course, all that gain was given up soon. So uh, the lesson should be learned by the American people. They should watch this because the uh, sovereign debt crisis here in the United States can explode before them, explode in a, at, at, at a speed that nobody is reckoning. The mainstream media will not tell the people what is going on, perhaps because they don't know, and uh, the governing classes are inadequate to the problem, and the only thing people can do is, is uh, provide some protection by, from themselves by, by insulating themselves from the calamity of the U.S. dollar, and the only way to really do that is precious metals, gold, and, and silver as well. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right. And um, uh, I, I'm interested that uh, you can use the European experience as uh, an object lesson. I think the only difference between the two is perhaps one which isn't all that favorable as far as the dollar is concerned, and that is that uh, your government, uh, or rather the, its agent, the Federal Reserve Board, are free to trash the currency as a short-term solution to any problem, real or imagined, um, whereas the Europeans don't actually have that facility because the ECB is uh, is a separate entity. It's responsible to the politicians, obviously, um, because at the end of the day, every central bank is, but it's not responsible to any particular little group of politicians like the Greeks or the Spanish or the Italians. Um, but, Charles, this has been a fascinating interview, and I, I'm very, very grateful that you... Um, took time out to speak to us. Um, and uh, where can um, our uh, listeners find you on, on, on the internet? Is, have, is, I mean, where, where do we find the Freedom and Prosperity Letter? Do you just Google it, or is there a yes, website? Probably the best place to go is to charlesgoyette.com, and you'll be forwarded immediately to my new book and uh, a link as well for the Freedom and Prosperity Letter. Uh, if you'll go to charlesgoyette.com, that's spelled G-O-Y-E-T-T-E, charlesgoyette.com. By the way, Alistair, I have to tell you my great respect for uh, uh, your organization, not only the foundation, but gold money as well. I, I see, I see a, a, a real threat to all of our prosperity and livelihoods in the offing having to do with the collapse of the payments system. Nothing happens if there is not a payment system, a viable payment system in place. And, uh, you know, the destruction of a currency is sand in the gears of commerce that makes uh, reliable, uh, particularly in the presence of the legal tender laws that we have in the United States, all of this threatens to, to bring commerce to a halt at, at enormous uh, cost to our, our prosperity. And it's uh, gold money provides a, a wonderful solution to uh, uh, this threat to the payment system. Yes, I, I, I think um, a lot of um, people who have used the gold money facility are worried precisely about that point. Um, you know, uh, going down this route, uh, unless something changes, there is a distinct possibility that when you go to use the ATM one day, <laughs> nothing will come out of it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, at that point, um, I think uh, ownership of precious metals, as you, which you referred to earlier, um, you know, is something that you'll heave a sigh of relief that you actually <laughs> decided to, to uh, take out a little insurance. Anyway, Charles, that was really great, and thank you very much indeed. And, um, you know, perhaps we can do this again um, in the not-too-distant future. Well, I certainly hope so, Alistair. I thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure.